Welcome to Cloud Control, the podcast about all things past, present, and future in cloud computing with some unique and insightful discussions about the journeys of the professionals who power the cloud industry. Presented by Spot by NetApp. I'm your host, Sean Harris, Developer Relations Lead at Spot. And on today's episode, we are pleased to welcome, after months of trying to get him on the program, Bill Clayman. Bill, you have over 15, has over 15 years of experience as a cloud architect, an IT executive, and a thought leader around digital infrastructure. He's originally from Ukraine, and he displayed early talents in music, which we'll talk more about because I'm a music nerd too, while moving to the United States as a child. His journey in technology began with network engineering and evolved across startups, MSPs, and major enterprises. He was named an AWS serverless hero and an Oracle Cloud Infrastructure Influencer for his pro- prolific contributions. And he's also a regular author, speaker at major industry conferences worldwide, and he has a unique passion for education through university lectures, podcasts, and his leadership roles focused on the next generation of infrastructure engineers. All interesting things. Bill, thank you for joining us on Cloud Control. How are you? I am well. Thank you so much for having me. What a wonderful introduction. I, I'm like picking out bits and pieces that I want to just just dive into you. It's so many wonderful people. Th- yes, we've been trying to do this for months, but between New Zealand, Portugal, Portland, Austin, uh, Phoenix, Arizona, and living what I feel is out of out of Terminal 1 on O'Hare in Chicago here, I'm glad to finally be here with you, Sean, uh, and, and I, I can't wait to have a very exciting conversation. I'm actually extra amped up because it is like zero degrees outside right now, so this is me just trying to stay warm, if anything. Hey, I get it. It's 16 degrees outside as I'm recording this in Salt Lake City, and so I get the the, the, the winter chill is real here. I mean, balmy. Balmy for Chicagoan. When we were when I started doing the prep for this episode, you and I have a very similar background. We be, we both came up through traditional infrastructure as sysadmins and engineers and mm-hmm. built out data centers. We've both worked in higher ed and are very passionate about higher ed and um, empowering the next generation of infrastructure nerds or engineers, whichever one. I, I like nerd, but engineers is the more appropriate term. It's an endearing term. It is right when we use nerds it, it, with people in our community. It's one of respect, right? Like I, I hear me. That means, I mean, look, I've got, I've got, I got Wolverine behind me. I've got like Captain America, and you know, I, I, I get it. Yeah, we, we geek out, we nerd out. It's all good. You started out in music, though. So, what did you play? And tell us about kind of your background in music because I'm a music nerd. So, wow. I mean, you've got a record right behind you there. So, so I love it. Um, that that's a fascinating conversation to start with. So. Okay, okay, okay. I'm, I'm gonna try and back up a little bit. So, so uh, I'm originally from Soviet Ukraine, um, and and in in Ukraine, we we actually, and this is this is kind of there's a side conversation. I got into this industry um, because of my brother, who also actually was is a mu- music, um, uh, really talented musician. Um, and, and back in in Kiev, Ukraine, when we lived out there, um, one of the things that he did was compete in telegraph competitions. I'm like, I'm not kidding, like literal telegraphs, Morse code and stuff. And I must have been like five, six, seven years old, and he would let me sit on his lap, and he'd put these giant cans on me, these guys, and he would teach me Morse code. And actually, that's how I got into into technology, is, believe it or not. Uh, yes, we had phones in Soviet Ukraine, but it was a fascinating concept of how we can communicate between people. Now, but music specifically, um, in, in Ukraine, my brother finished the, the musical conservatory. Um, it was back in, in the Soviet Union, and a very brilliant pianist, uh, finished the the schooling there and then brought it here. I started there, uh, but then finished uh, some more classwork and and uh, classical piano training here in the United States. And then I picked up guitar. Um, my favorite guitar was my very first one that I think I got. I was age sixteen or seventeen years old. Uh, a, a beautiful cherry burst, uh, sun cherry red burst. Uh, the Epiphone Alley Cat with dual humbucker pickups, hollow body electric guitar um it's downstairs uh, i just put new strings on it recently and it's 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 my favorite pretty sure one of the one of the treble knobs doesn't really work quite well anymore that's on me i need to get to, get to the shop but that is that is my favorite favorite um guitars followed by my ibanez juggernaut and uh my my other my yamaha um not quite as large it's also an acoustic guitar uh, acoustic electric, but I d- usually don't plug it in too often. But so yeah, I I, I enjoy uh, I enjoy playing classical piano. Right now, I'm in the Star Wars kick. I'm not kidding right now. Like I'm like just listening to musical renditions. 
of of uh, really beautifully played like the intros for for Anakin and like just how you play him on the piano. So I've been totally like looking up really fun like YouTube videos and checking out notes on how to just play like classical intro sounds to like Star Wars right now on the piano. So I'm not kidding. That's been like my jam. But um, yeah, I, I do enjoy music. You will find me sitting in front of my piano if I hear like a really cool song um, or something really, really pretty that I really enjoy. I'm really fortunate to have a great musical ear. So a lot of the songs uh, that I can play, I can usually pick up. Um, I I, remarkably, I was I did the um, uh, uh, Bach Staccato Fugue in D minor uh, a good quarter of it entirely by by ear before I started looking at at the notes and seeing I was playing it completely wrong. It was just what I like to play versus how it should be played. So yes, Sean, I I have all the technology podcasts I've ever done in my entire life. I don't think I've ever really had a chance to talk uh, about my musical. Um, aspirations. Now, here's a good one. When we came to the United States uh, for a period of time, I was a professional DJ. And I I worked at some clubs here in Chicago. They no longer exist, like one or two gigs. Uh, I used to do a lot of weddings. I still have some gear. And on occasion, I will put up my mixer, my 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 little my little electric tables, and I will I will just jam out to some of the latest. I do like um EDC electronic dance music, so I love uh, like Armin Van Buren and Tiesto and Calvin Harris. Those people are like rock stars. Um, and sometimes I'll just make some mixes. But holy cow, Sean, what a great way to start this chat! Yeah, music. Well, I think it's I think it's fascinating because music plays so it is so intricate, and so is network engineering. And so I think finding ways to have that creative outlet. And you talk about the telegraph and that being your real gateway into tech, right? Like when you think about it, that just takes phone freaking to a new level. Like we did in the eighties. Right. Like I'm a millennial saying that I got into it via telegraph. Right. It's not like, you know, I, I preserved my first, you took, it to, you took it to the old, you took it to the old school level, right? You took it back past the phone. It's no longer about trying to dial tones. It's trying to figure out how to make telegraph work. So I know it was, it was nice. And I am a, and I'm a total music nerd. The, record that's blurred out behind me is a signed record of London Calling by The Clash. And then I have a pretty extensive guitar collection too, because I also play um, guitar. I, pl- I grew up listening to old school country and punk rock and rockabilly. And so I, that's what I play. And then I also love EDM and Chicago being the home of all things EDM as we know it. You know, you've got famous DJs that were all over the place there. Bad Boy Bill comes to mind being based out of Chicago, right? So yeah, it's John R. Oh my gosh. A lot of things in common that really make this topical. So with network engineering, you moved from the on-prem world to the cloud. We were talking before we started about you're going to an actual traditional infrastructure conference. And one of the things that I've wanted to talk about and get some thought leadership on is the impact of the VMware Broadcom merger acquisition Broadcom's acquisition of VMware where because cloud computing is taking off and so prevalent post in in the post pandemic world but in that post pandemic world we see a lot of people that are making that decision of do I go back from the cloud that I moved to on one day in March 2020 and am I going to move stuff back into the data center and what's the implications of something as big as the industry leader like VMware being acquired by Broadcom, and what are the upsides and downsides that you see from your side of that, from your vantage point? So, um, Sean, I, I I appreciate that question. So, we'll, we'll let, let's make sure we talk about that. Um, I I feel really fortunate uh, because I wasn't adopted into this industry. I'm not a former, you know, electrician or teacher, pediatrician, whatever. I I um, I did get a network engineering undergraduate degree, uh, and in parallel, I, I was also doing my my CCNA. So, like, really out of college, I had uh, some some pretty good Microsoft MCSCs, um, MCSA uh, certifications coming out, and I did go to a trade school, which was really beneficial to me um, because I was I was 21 years old with a networking engineering bachelor's degree, and so I jumped right into the industry. It was 19 years ago, actually. And here I was working in the data center space before they even called them data centers, right? These nondescript buildings located in the middle server of Server rooms. Computer right. rooms, right? Thank you. Thank you. Server rooms and network closets. Yes. 
and and so and so I, I I really do get a chance to see sort of this 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 growth of of what's been happening out there. And, and everybody listening, this sounds so pretentious. You're welcome to find me. Please do. I love interactive audiences, and I love to continue these conversations. So find me out there on LinkedIn, and let's keep this chat going. Um, but what was fascinating to me is I had a chance to work as a network engineer, junior guy, brought up in that space, worked in the end user community. Uh, I worked at a company called MTM Technologies, uh, which for some of you virtualization folks out there, they were the largest Citrix Platinum partner in the country. Very big VMware, Microsoft partner as well. I was their chief technology officer after the course of about seven years. Uh, I grew from a virtualization architect to a director of VP and their CTO as well. Um, after that, I actually spent some time at, and all of you DevOps people are probably going to know this company called EPAM Systems. So that was about a year there. Um, a lot of DevOps, a lot of cloud migration, refactoring the six hours of applications, which we may not even have all the time to talk about, but we're going to touch on the question around uh, cloud migration and refactoring and, um, uh, well, what's what's the word? Uh, uh, on-prem, right? Getting all that stuff pulled on-prem. So the the acquisition of um, of VMware into into uh, into Broadcom, um, if, if I'm not mistaken, it was a 60, 61 billion dollar acquisition. It was it was completed, and there were there were still there were still some some challenges around what is support going to ultimately look like. What is the pricing going to ultimately look like? And then there's there's the ultimate question of all right, what if we only license it like you can only use VMware on Broadcom chips or Broadcom silica, right? So so the reality of the station is is there's two truths to it. VMware will continue to have a very powerful foothold in this industry, um, and you saw that very evident because of the challenges that Citrix had, right? You saw a technology which was built. Let's be honest, I love Ica. I love all the stuff they did around RDX. I love all the stuff they did um, around optimization, but it was really a bridge between legacy applications and our ability to bring them to you, the people listening. I mean, if you, you, I'm not going to lie to you. I worked on IBM A's for hundreds, the Microsofts, the green screens. I remember publishing those green screens into Citrix and making sure that all of your, your, your crazy shortcut keys were available to you when you punched that stuff into your little Microsoft client. And and we saw the challenges that nobody really wanted to ultimately buy uh, until they became like the cloud software group most recently, if I'm not mistaken. Um, Citrix, because like, w what does the future look like? They look like they're web-enabled, browser-based, right? Really much more lightweight applications that aren't going to require that kind of physical deployment. Now, Netscalers, and I'm still calling them Netscalers because that's what they are in my heart. If you know what they are, the Citrix load balancer, whatever you want to call them, um, was the real entryway to the data center market for Citrix. But if we look at VMware specifically, um, you know, there's the, there's there's uh, you know the very potential that Broadcom is going to announce a VMware price hike. Um, you know, where they want to get people much more into the framework of VMware Broadcom outside of using folks like Nutanix, because let's be honest, Nutanix has their own little engine that you can use if you want. And so they're trying to sort of pinch the market a little bit, um, you know, more effectively. And the other the other challenge is that we're going to potentially see out there is there going to be uh, ramifications around uh, um, the silicon? Is there going to be ramifications around, you know, support potentially as well? I I don't like to look at things negatively, I, I think that this should hopefully ultimately help uh, the end user because Broadcom is a fairly, fairly sizable organization. And I think that there's going to be some pretty good optimizations that you can build into the virtualization layer so that you could have that um, that pair of virtualization, those drivers that really look much more deep into the hardware behave much, much more effectively, efficiently, whatever word you want to throw in there um, between that virtualization layer and the hardware. So it's it's a long-winded answer, Sean, and everybody listening, right? There's there's going to be ramifications around this, but in some instances, we see VMware and even things like Citrix as bridging technologies, as, as legacy technologies, right? I, I, don't, I don't think that virtualization is going anywhere, to be perfectly blunt. I've got a three-quarter rack on my house, and it's running running VMware happily. Um, but to, to that extent, you know, what are we developing in the future? What do modern applications look like? What do serverless architectures resemble? Um, you know, how are applications moving away from legacy waterfall designs into true DevOps? And I use that word very carefully, true DevOps 
uh, types of architectures that are super lightweight, that are much more not cloud first, because we're going to talk about that, I'm sure, Sean, but much more oriented towards uh, an agile type of deployment model. Well, I think that that's a great point because, I mean, VMware was really the catalyst for what is now cloud infrastructure, right? Like the idea that you could run multiple VMs on one piece of hardware and slice up the resources is really what gave birth to AWS, which is really what has given birth to this huge industry that we've seen take off in the, in the mid-2000s. It also makes me wonder if the focus is going to be more towards the hybrid world, right? Where the reality is people think are going to have things on-prem and in the cloud because for resiliency. Um, but it also makes me wonder if it's going to force a company like VMware who has made a lot of different acquisitions that seemed out of band for their core market, right? Cloud native stuff. If it's going to make them dial it back in and we're going to see little slivers of VMware be sliced off and, and spun out or sold off. Right. So it's an interesting thing to watch. And it's yeah. Yeah. interesting because you're seeing the same thing happen with Terraform and the Open Tofu project and the split after those licensing changes, which again have a huge ramification for people who are not only cloud native, but also that hybrid role. So when it comes to infrastructure as code and the goal to make infrastructure as code work the same on prem and in the cl in cloud native, do you think that that split was a good thing for Open Tofu and Terraform, or do you think it's going to clutter the market? And there are some things that pe we need to consider that we haven't really thought through, um, just because of how rapidly that fork happened. Let's start with the reality: when a seismic event happens, like a split, like that, or like a Broadcom VMware sort of merger. Any situation like that, you know, it forces us, the end user, who are potentially users of these technologies, to take a step back and ask ourselves a simple question. We have to. Do we stay? Do we endure? Or do we move on to something else? If that shake, little earthquake, little seismic shift didn't happen, we wouldn't be asking those questions. So in any, in any situation, um, you do bring up the very real likelihood of, you know, of a chance of losing a potential customer to... You know, an entire, an entirely new type of platform, which is why I believe things like QBRs and regular communications with your, uh, with your leading customers is really important because you will know if they're looking at different platforms, different avenues to deploy applications and tool sets. Any sort of abrupt change that's not well designed and well planned out is going to have negative impacts on, on an organization. Now, to your earlier point, I absolutely believe it's going to be more of a hybrid model. Now, I am going to share something uh, with this cloud control podcast audience that is very, very nascent. So um, I get a chance to write and create the AFCOM State of the Data Center report. And one of the questions that you asked me here was, hey, Bill, uh, what's happening in the space of, of cloud, um, you know, cloud repatriation? And, and, and what does that look like? Well, the fascinating thing in that sense is like, I'm, I'm as, as literally as we're talking about this, I'm trying to I'm trying to pull up. Uh, that that one slide. I literally just got these results very recently, so uh, I found them. I found the I found the slides. All right. So one of the things that, that that I think is really really important is we as a market, everyone. And this this isn't this. I'm not trying to segment any business. Uh, we've reached a certain level of maturity with the cloud, where if you know Sean says I need to deploy this this app this tool, my standard response is no longer put it in Amazon, not cloud first. It's where should it live? Where does it most economically live? Just because it's in the cloud doesn't mean it needs to stay there. And even more importantly, with things like FinOps, financial operations, which I'm sure I hope everyone here at least knows about, you start to ask the question of, um, does it belong in the cloud? How much does it cost me to deploy this widget on premise? And begin with repatriation in mind. So we, we asked a question from um, from our audience, and we asked them migration of workloads from cloud back to on-premise and the subsequent impact on low demand. So this year, we saw 71% uh, have seen a migration of workloads from cloud back to on-premise data centers or co-location. And as a result, 71% have seen an increase in power load demand, um, of which a quarter have said that this impact is significant. Now, I don't want you to get 
emails or hate mails or anything on Twitter or X, whatever you want to call it, say, Bill Clave is saying the cloud is going away. I'm not. Oh, my God, people, I'm not saying the cloud is going away. Oh, my goodness. What I'm saying is that we have a greater level of maturity and understanding of what needs to live in the cloud and where. And the reality is the next question that I usually get, and we did ask this, okay, Bill, that's some really good statistics. Well, what is being moved? I'll, I'll be happy to read off, like, let's say a top five here. So ERP systems with about 40%, storage management with about 36%, web apps, 32%, IT management solutions, 38%. And we got about a quarter of people saying commercially licensed databases, BDI, virtual applications, and even, drumroll, about a quarter are saying custom applications and DevOps processes, services, and even Kubernetes. So things that in the past you'd say are default by have to live in the cloud, now, I'm and I'm excited about this. I, I like this level of maturity in our industry. People are coming out and saying, what does a hybrid model look like? What does a multi-cloud model look like? How much does it cost me to deploy this stuff in Amazon? And now... With things like generative AI, large language models, doing things like inference training, training on things like Lambda and, and all these other different, different kind of tool sets, you're talking about a relatively exponential cost factor and power consumption factor of what you can do at Amazon versus what you could do at an on-premise data center. And that's that's just something that we've been working on in my organization is that we do the same hardware, the same kind of platform for any sort of AI and ML uh, data scientists at like 40% of the cost of Amazon in parity. So that's where a lot of these conversations are happening. So to answer your question, very long-winded, Sean, um, when, when these splits happen, you will have the questioning of the infrastructure. And unless you have direct visibility into your organization, you need to know what their plans are. You do, because if your top customer has a plan of moving part of their workloads on-prem and you introduce this seismic shift, you're going to accelerate that strategy. Yeah, that's a great point. And one of the things I wanted to talk to you about is um, AI, right? And its impact on the cloud. Because AI is super hot right now and some of us are tired of hearing about it and others are you know just trying to figure out what they're going to do with it and every company is trying to figure out how they can make their product do something with it it's been really explosive over the last year and a half we, we started playing with large language models we started seeing it but chat gpt and all of the microsoft co-pilots and every cloud company trying to do that new.ro and neu.ro neuro yeah neu.ro all good all right, perfect. Is really pioneering the innovations around sustainable and ethical AI, but doing it in a in a bare metal co-hosted space instead of the traditional cloud. Exactly. How did you how did you get into this space? And when it comes to ethical AI, I want to get your some thoughts on what you think let's have a discussion about what ethical AI is. Because I think it means a lot of different things to a lot of different people. And I think it's something that's very topical that I want to make sure that we hit on while we're here. Neuro, um, it's important to get some background here. Neuro was founded in 2019. You know, they were born in Ukraine. And in 2019, Neuro was founded and built by AI, data, and ML scientists for use by AI and ML and data scientists, which is why we were very successful. And one of the things in developing our platform, and for everybody listening, Neuro is a Kubernetes layer, an interoperability uh, um, platform that is is basically like the VMware of AI, right? We The closest comparison I can give to everybody to better understand it is like AWS SageMaker. Uh, you have the GPU layer, right? And we are that software layer that's on top that allows you to aggregate all these tools together. But when we built it, we actually designed it to be a multi-tenant architecture, right? So Sean Harris, right? Um, you have a bunch of GPUs and they could be Intel, AMD, or NVIDIA. What we've created is an architecture, an interoperability layer that allows you to point all of those hardware resources to Neuro. And what we do is we split those jobs into what's known as atomic workload. So each job can be processed per card where we don't have to translate between physical cards. So like the Synapse AI from Intel and CUDA from NVIDIA, you don't have to actually work together as long as it's pointing to our orchestration layer. So what we've done is we created a multi-tenant interoperability layer that is the only one of its kind in the market, right? There are other ML and IOPS platforms out there, but that's like one platform gets deployed on, on you know, or one application tool gets deployed on one platform and that's it. But we're doing it from a multi-tenant perspective. So 
Um, when we were born in 2019, unfortunately, you know, as a Ukrainian company, many of our customers were in, in Russia. So we had to shut that down and bring all this stuff over here in the United States, which we've done successfully. And here in the United States, what we found is that we're being driven not necessarily by the data centers. We're being driven by the data center's customers. Follow me on this for a second. Many of these customers already have Exchange and SQL servers and VMware and Citrix servers at these very trusted co-location sites. So what they're doing is they're going to their trusted partners and saying, I am paying $8 million a year for this rack at Amazon. What can you do for me? And what we've done is that we reduce that cost to like $4 million a rack and even throw in a full-blown platform. Now, you don't have to spend this much money. Obviously, that's like a full rack of H100s. You could just use one card and pay way, way, way less than that. Oh, my goodness. Um, but what we've done is we've democratized the access to these most advanced technologies. Now, it hasn't been easy. It hasn't been easy. The majority of my industry is used to running at like 8, 9, 10 kilowatts per rack. Do you realize how much kilowatts, how much density an H100 node requires? Between 10 and 12 kW for one of them. Imagine putting like four or five into a freaking rack. You're going to run out of capacity very fast. So there's a lot of catching up my industry has to do. There's a saying, don't laugh. The data center industry loves innovation as long as it's 10 years old. Which is true. Right. We don't have 10 years. We barely have 10 months as these hyperscalers. Right. You're trying to play catch up. Exactly. And we're, we're, we're being leapfrogged by... Uh, by some of these major hyperscalers, but the market is is very, very hungry for these kinds of resources. So we're being driven by customers who are asking for data locality. They're asking for more cost control. They don't want their information to be used to train some big foundational model. But the big response that we're getting from data center clients is like, we have no idea what to do here. And in just putting GPU as a service, while great, that puts it on the customer to bring in their tool sets, to retool and rebuild everything. But what we do is that platform layer and we white label it. So we let the data centers put their logo on there. Yeah. Basically, we've accelerated a data center's access in this market by helping them save millions of dollars in development and years in trying to create the software. That's awesome. So when it comes to ethical AI, what are some of the biggest challenges in ethical AI? Thank you for that. Yeah. What do you, because I have some thoughts on this, <laughs> but I want to hear your thoughts and then we can di then we can dive into how we can democratize and make EI or AI, EI, make AI more equitable. So when we when we founded Neuro, it was built on three very important core principles. And and, and everybody listening, um, whether you work with me, somebody else, AI ethics, AI transparency, and AI sustainability. We we built our our, our ecosystem on on those very very foundational aspects. So, um, you know, AI sustainability, for example, we are one of the few actually that has a what's known as a green scheduler in our ecosystem on the portal itself. You can run and trade your jobs when it's most efficient, for example, when power costs are the lowest or when, when utilization is the lowest. And we actually show you, you've saved this much in your CO2 emissions, which is the equivalent of, I don't know, like 58 trucks or something like that, right? We'll, we'll show you how much you've actually saved and an impact simply by scheduling your jobs more effectively. Then you've got AI transparency. In in that sense, you actually know everything that's happening from the back end. Now, again, what we've done is we give our um, our users access to a UI as well as an extraordinary powerful CLI. Now, if everyone's brave here, you're welcome to go on my, on my LinkedIn page and find one of the videos that we've done. We did a full-blown LinkedIn Live demo of the Neural Platform where we actually show what the backend sequencing looks like when we ran a Fibonacci sequence, ran it in Python, and it was producing tokens crazy fast for us running on V100s. V100s, which are about a third of the power of the A100 cards, right? So when it's engineered properly, you could do some really cool things. So AI transparency really talks about a deep connection with the people using these technologies and you are transparent with the technologies that are being applied so they can have a deep understanding of what they're actually doing, right? It's not just, here's a UI, and then everything else is sort of a secret. Now, obviously, there's some intellectual property we, we just can't divulge, but the process, the means, the translation layer, the code, everything, we're, we're happy to showcase that. Now, the important question, AI ethics. What does it mean to be ethical in, in working with AI? Um, we have a consulting practice as a part of our a part of our business. 
And, you know, uh, it, it, it's a no BS approach. I don't need, we don't need to swear on this podcast, but it's a no BS approach where a lot of our customers and interactions are as follows. Bill, here's our data. Here's our problem. We understand large language models are extraordinary. We have no idea to, what to do with Stack. So our company, we will, uh, we will build their LLM, we will train it with them, and then we will deploy it into a facility, for example, Sean Harris data centers or something like that, and then help them operate. A big part of the ethical conversation point is a, a very clear understanding of what the data is producing, how it's sourced, uh, and actually running, I don't want to say like, we don't want to waste time, but having detailed workshops. So for example, we, we did a project with a company. I can't say who they are. Um, they, they're a very large sports car company. Let's just leave it at that. And they asked us to train a, a, an LLM for them, uh, for their engineers to come in and be able to like reference bits and parts and pieces. Because right now their engineers have to go into three or four different storage repositories just to answer the question of how do I put a lock on this door, for example, right? Now they can ask a question, how do I put this lock on this door? And they get conscious answers. Now, I don't, I'm not talking like, you know, Skynet conscious, but like conscious answers in the sense of it's very precise um, and they can get links to whatever they want. Now, they came to us and said, we want a demo done in a week. A demo done in a week. Now, if anybody out there understands large language models, AI, inference training, and all of that, you are probably laughing because you can't, you just can't, you can't train something complicated and hope and expect that you get the same response and for it not to be convoluted. So one of the things in ethics is to make sure that people understand things like biases. What does that mean when a certain piece of data uh, gets an unfair weight to a certain type of response. And then you get, you know, obviously things like hallucinations or improper responses. So ethics is taking the customer on the journey with us and persistently ensuring that they see that they have full control over their data, their repositories, um, where it's being managed, and, and most of all, having control over things like cost, resource utilization, um, and then ultimately how it's being, how it impacts the end user. So the entire life cycle of the model from the start to the finish, making sure that it's being, it's basically everything about it is, is done ethically. So clean, clear, um, there's very clear communication. And it, it, believe it or not, it's, it's something that's not, you don't get that. Like if you go on and deploy something in, in Amazon AWS, for example, on SageMaker, it's you. you, you're pretty much doing this, but with a good partner that can take you to this journey, you have a much more intimate understanding of what your data is actually doing. For an organization like yours, where your job is that consultancy and helping people on that journey and build out those language models, how does diversity in your workforce take shape that kind of um, building that those models out to ensure that they're not getting the inherent bias, right? Like one of my favorite books that I've read over the last, during the pandemic and beyond and before is called Weapons of Math math destruction which is all about ai the future of ai and not having enough diverse voices so how does neuro approach that diverse voice to make sure that you're not getting a biased model on the back end and poison and basically being a poison pill to future models right because you use the groundwork and should and that groundwork goes between projects how do you keep that from poisoning your data models that you're you're helping your customers build? And how do you explain that to them? That's a really, oh man, that's a really, really, really good question, Sean. Um, I wish we had another hour just to talk about this. At at Neuro, we, we have should we actually should have another episode. Yeah, and... just just on that, just on ethics alone. Um, it, at, at Neuro, we have a very diverse workforce. We've got uh, folks that are, uh, you know, everywhere all over the world, people of color, you know, women, female leaders. When, and this is really important for us, and this is one of those few times you're going to see me slow down, and yes, I'm excited about this. So facial recognition, facial recognition, right? Uh, notoriously bad for being racist. <laughs> and that's a very upfront statement, right? And, they're, they just and don't it's true, right? It's true. I think that... Because, and I think that the thing that we forget when we, when we talk about this is we're not trying to say the company did this on purpose because yes, I worked for a company, I worked for a company that did video job interview software. And it was one of the things that was brought up repeatedly and we've seen studies on it. And I don't think it's saying 
company you're doing a bad job and you're trying to do this on purpose, I think by calling it out and by you and I, and this is the the engineering problem that I talk about where I say, I'm just a boring white guy, right? And I've been lucky enough to have a very blessed career that's grown because of this. And I've worked in a lot of spaces and had a lot of exposure that others haven't. And that's really shaped my career. And these, it, it, it would shape, if I was working in these models, it would shape that. And I think the reality is we have to be able to talk about this intelligently to say, why are those biases there? Not because somebody's racist, not because somebody's trying to poison that data, but just because of who's programming it. So that's one thing I want to make sure that we say is we're not trying to throw anybody out of the bus. We're not trying, we're, we're just trying to have a discussion to help these companies see what we're seeing and what's being talked about so that they can make those changes. It's very dangerous to get it wrong. That's what I need to make sure people understand, our customers, right? Especially if they're doing any sort of model that is looks at people, you know, whether it's identification, whether it's voice-based. Um, you know, a, a, a language model or AI facial recognition model that's developed and trained on white people, it's going to get have a lot of problem identifying people of color or brown folks. So, so it, that, that's the challenge that we, we dive into. As an organization, as Neuro, with, with our consultancy practice, we, we take extra time and extra caution where when we look at data sets, different types of ingestion, because we work with all different kinds of data, structured unstructured, you know, emails, you know, PDF printouts, you know, the, the, the chicken scratches of doctor's notes that need to get ingested. The point is that when we look at these data types and we see that there's any sort of potential for this information to be misconstrued, create a biased, inaccurate, resp inaccurate response, that's dangerous. Because what we want to do is when we build a solution, a large language model, that when you ask it a question, the responses are highly, highly, highly predictable, accurate. Uh, they don't hallucinate, and that they are um, repetitive. They're 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 the same. And not when I'm saying the same, because when you obviously interact with the model, you do inference training, and it becomes smarter itself. The response continues to um, evolve with how the data is being trained. It just doesn't start to hallucinate on its own based on some new variables that you introduce to it. So for us. Ethics is a very careful guided journey through the data, the problem, and what that outcome is going to look like, which is part of the reason why we do things like MVPs, minimally viable products, because we do train on real data. We do create a real, real, real life solution, but it's instead of a like multi-billion parameter model, it might be like 100,000, 200,000 parameters just to build out the solution so we can showcase that these responses are repetitive, predictable, not hallucinating and that we do this every single time, regardless of the type of input that we get in. Not every partner does this. A lot of partners focus on the outcome and the final result rather than the journey to get there. Um, and a lot of that revolves around somebody giving you a quote to develop your pro platform two weeks less and for 10 grand less. That 10 grand can cost you quite a bit. My only advice to you, whether you work with my company, EPAM, uh, Blue Wave, oh, there's just so many great companies out there is that you you really don't just look at the cost because if you get your output or your data mechanisms wrong and you start to get like the wrong kinds of architecture or models or or responses holy cow that that could have absolutely detrimental impacts on what you're trying to build in general so these these aren't solutions that you can rush right this isn't something that you can take corners with especially so a big part of ethics is is actually taking the time and this is where it gets a little bit difficult to understand the entire journey from the inception to what's being ingested um because biases don't just have to be uh people related right we're doing something for a logistics company right now as well right we want to make sure that we understand all the different kinds of trucks that they have so that it's not biased towards one truck which is this one's better but it's going to cost you more money and it's not going to be effective for the business that's a horrible situation we don't want that that kind of model to, to be impacted. So it's it's throughout the entire process of, of being ethical, obviously towards human beings, but the business itself and making sure that the outcome is, is beneficial. So the big push that we're seeing in AI right now, and this and I've got one more AI question after this, and then we'll um, wrap up with a little bit of some thought leadership from here. But one of the 
things that we're seeing right now is a big jump for government regulation on AI and regulating what you can and can't do with a, you know, important topics that we need to think about. But how do you think that equity and divert and ensuring um, that ethical development approach is going to work? And are you guys, is Neuro taking a lead on wanting to be involved in developing some of that regulation that is going to come down the pipe at some point? That's a really great question. And and for everybody listening, I don't I don't think I had access to any of these. So these are these are like, you know, Sean's firing these from the hip. We we at Neuro, we believe in regulation. We do. We we believe that these technologies because we understand it. We 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 see how this stuff works. Um, you know, we've built large language models and sales assistance for, you know, the world's largest cosmetics company, Caribbean cruise companies that you've probably taken. Um, and, and we take a very, very documented and careful approach to this. And but we've been around since 2019, and I, I know that only is like only five years. But in the, in the world of IT, we're ancient. Um, we're 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 uh, we're mature, as I like to say. Okay. Um, so so Sean, when when we start to take a look at uh, at how how all of this becomes um, you know developed, it's 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 all it's all about um, it's all about the journey and, and just making sure that you answer all of your questions throughout that entire journey to ensure that that you have um, a product finally that you could be certainly proud of. Um, but again, it it doesn't matter who you ultimately work with. It it just matters that you have clear communication and understanding of what you're trying to build. So at at Neuro, um, you know, we've taken this really cautious approach. We we believe in standardization. I, I really, or even regulation, standardization and even regulation, I think is fine because this is a powerful technology. You know, everybody listening, it's, it's when, when we were trying to be under the radar, we really tried to be under the radar, like January, February, March, and then South Park came out and did an episode on ChatGPT. If you remember, it was called Deep Learning. If you haven't seen that episode, mm-hmm. it's both amazing and scary, literally a combination of the two. Because at the very end of that episode, you saw the credits roll and it said written by Matt Stone and ChatGPT. It was good. And out of that, we get calls. We get so many phone calls. Can you do this, Bill? What else can you do with this data? Can you model this kind of stuff? Can you Everybody this? wants an AI model. Everyone wants an AI model, right? And and so and so now we're, we're, we're educating. We're, half our time is spent educating the customer about what they can do with the data and then talking about the actual product and solution. I'm getting off topic. Regulation and uh, you know standardization besides itself, but regulation of this level of technology is really important because with GPT-4 multimodal model architectures where you can now uh, throw at it uh, multimedia like audio and video and images and get like real conscious text back, that's extraordinary. And GPT-5 is slated to be the closest thing we'll have to a conscious conversation with a large language model and an engine. We're going to have to convince ourselves this isn't some Turing test that we have to go through. We're actually talking to a machine here. So, you know, at, at, at what point do, do we give too much power to these machines where they have control of decision-making capabilities over critical systems that we might not necessarily want them to have control over? And it's not that they're sentient. It's that we probably just gave them too much control and we didn't design it properly. That's the big difference here. They're not sentient. We just didn't do it right. So, so the the need for regulation there is is going to be critical. To really, to you know, we don't pull the Homer Simpson and press the wrong button um, in, in the nuclear reactor here. Um, we're, we're we're fans of it. We think it's very very important. We don't think it's limiting either. We don't think it's going to limit the capability of solutions. If anything, it's going to put out some really important guardrails. The other hot topic that we're talking that we talk a lot about outside of AI and the ethic, the ethicity and the um, equality of AI is sustainability. How does, where you're running large language models, you're running a lot of silicon, you're running on-prem. The idea is that the cloud has always been greener because scales of economy, Amazon can do more with their climate pledge and stuff. Um, Azure has a big initiative, initiative. How does sustainability impact what you guys do? And how do you advise customers who want to be more sustainable and know that they're that um, a company like Neuro that they're partnering with to build some of this stuff is doing so sustainably. How do you report that back to the customer, and where do you see that going from here? That's uh, my gosh, that's such that's such a big question. I'm actually gonna pull up a couple of quick notes here uh, to to answer that a little bit better. Um, so obviously, ChatGPT, we've experienced that. Just just to kind of put it into perspective, 
they reached uh, 1 million users in, in five days. And I think over the course of about nine months, they were just close to about a billion active users. There's only one app. Everybody listening, there's only one application that was capable of getting to 1 million users faster than the ChatGPT, and it was Threads. They did it in about an hour. You using Threads? Anybody using Threads? No, but you use ChatGPT quite a bit, right? So we, we've done we've done some research here internally at at Neuro. So I'm going to share some some stats with everybody based on sustainability specifically, Sean and everybody listening. A single Google search can power a hundred watt light bulb for eleven seconds, consuming about 0.3 watt hours of energy. A single GPT like session. Now I say GPT like because it's it's ours. We don't use an open AI. This is stuff that we developed. Um, is about 800 to 1,000 times more powerful than a single Google search consuming between 300 and 400 watt hours of energy. Now, to put that in context, that's the equivalent of charging this smartphone about 60 times. So about a five-hour battery, you can charge it 60 times for a for, for single transaction. Now, that's, that's not the only thing. That Google stat, that's from 2011. So you know that they've already improved upon it. And when you take a look at ChatGPT, they don't run them per single query. They have six to eight queries per single process. So really you're talking about a single transaction size of in, in the kilowatt, one to three kilowatts per every single time you go out there and ask ChatGPT a silly question or ask Dolly to draw you a pug that's taking over the universe. So, you know, the, the reality the situation is the, the, and this was from, from IEEE. It was a very impactful quote. The pace of evolution is no longer sustainable. And that is a really, really critical point here. Um, so so, so we at Neuro, we've done some really special things. First of all, we partner with somebody called Cato Digital, which has taken over OCP, Open Compute Foundation Platform Compute, from Facebook. And these are the V100 cards. So circular economy, they've already got their carbon footprint out of the way. And we reuse that gear for large language model training. In fact, that's what we did that Python Fibonacci sequence architecture, that demo on those V100, on OCP gear that's been repurposed. Other partners that we've got, for example, um, at North or people in the Nordics, for example, um, we deploy our large language models, our architecture in environments that are 100% entirely powered by green energy. So that means you know that as long as you're running on Neuro in one of our facilities, your entire AI model is 100% green. Hydro, geo, uh, wind, for example, um, you know, very, very, very low impact kind of solutions out there. So we have been going out of our way to partner with um, uh, facilities that will go above and beyond in sourcing the energy from renewable energy sources. Now, not all of our partners are like that, but the majority of what we're doing does focus. And finally, the green scheduler we talked about earlier is in terms of just telling people it's not just about training your LLM it's also for showing them the impact so in the actual scheduler saying if you extend your training by a week or if you move it to these hours for example here's how much you can save so first of all partnering with infrastructure that's really important second of all the software layer itself is is really important um, and then thirdly just a conscious effort to make sure that what you're doing is truly sustainable please understand that it's so much more power consumption, so much more power consumption than your traditional Google search. And the reality is, final point here, Sean, we've experienced this human shift. The way that you and I interact with data has fundamentally changed. If you go on Google or Bing and you type in a freaking question, it's no longer a blue link. It's not. The first response you get is a generative AI response, which is absolutely wild just how fast that shift has happened. It is. And I think... Um... We need to have you back and have a deeper dive into that evolution. It's it's crazy. Yes. One of the things that we do on one of the reasons I love cloud control and being able to host it is we get to talk about the people behind the cloud that you don't get to see a lot of, right? Like you get to hear from engineers and what they're into. So you've been in the industry about the same time as I have. Like I think we probably started right around the same time. I started in 1998. Um, if you can go back to the beginning of your journey, your career, what advice would you give yourself and what do you wish you had known? What do you wish you knew now, had known then that you don't know? I am a perpetual optimist. Uh, and I'm very happy to say that I don't think I've changed very much since, uh, since I've, uh, I've been a kid. Um, so let's see. 
I, I graduated with my bachelor's degree in, you know, five, you know, five. So, so yeah, it's, it's literally been about 19, 20 years now. And, um, I, I don't, I don't think I would change anything to be honest. I, I really love the career path that I went down and, and the persistent curiosity. And I think that's, that's the only thing I would continue to tell myself is just continue to be persistently curious outside of obviously buying stock in like Google and some other stuff. But, uh, I, I, I'm really fortunate that I had a chance to work with physical, real physical infrastructure, everything from networking to high, uh, to, to converge infrastructure, to blade systems. And then I spent a year in the DevOps space. Um, you know, I, I think, I think if, if I were to go back to myself and be like, you know, learn more about the application side of it, the, what, what is actually running on all these physical systems that you're deploying, um, that's maybe the only, I think, modification that I would try and make, but Otherwise, I would say continue to diversify your understanding of technology beyond your existing purview to have a better understanding and, and visibility of everything that impacts today's digital world. No, that's a great point. A um, lot of turmoil going on in Ukraine over the last 12, 18 months, and that's where you're from. We talked about that at the beginning of the show. Not going to ask your opinion on that. What would you tell the the aspiring engineer or the aspiring nerd that wants to come up in our industry that's in Ukraine right now? What would you tell that that young mind about what they should do and how to keep their head up and end up on the career path that we have? To? First and most importantly, I'd say Slava Ukraini. Uh, and then, uh, secondly... We, we have engineers that are out there still in, in Ukraine. Um, and I'm not going to lie to you. Sometimes sometimes we've had to do demos while they're sitting in a bomb shelter. Um, and, 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 you know, when the customer is like, do you want us to reschedule? The response is no. Let them, let them, let them feel like they're human beings on normal. Let's have this freaking demo. I understand bombs are falling. Um, this, this industry, this world has become so much smaller because of what we do in terms of telecommunications and connectivity. Um, that, you know, effectively it matters more about what your passion, your interests are and your capability to impact this world, maybe more so than, than where you're located. Obviously, if you're in a war zone, it's going to make your life much more difficult. When our company started, we, we moved people with whatever money that we had out of Ukraine into Spain and Portugal and the United States and to all these different parts of the world. But if, if you're in, in Ukraine, um, you know, and you're young or you're, you're an engineer, you know, whether it's development or physical infrastructure, um, your capacity to impact this world is, 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 is never going to be, um, is never going to be nullified or squashed by, you know, the country that's just east of you. Um, there's, you have more friends than you would imagine. All it takes is just to reach out and talk to people like me, go on LinkedIn. Obviously that's very powerful. Some of the most brilliant and impactful people are, are in, in Eastern Europe and Ukraine. When I was at EPAM Systems, half my time was spent, you know, speaking in Russian or Ukrainian um, with people in Belarus, Russia, or Ukraine. So um, the kind of talent that is in that region is extraordinary. And it's, it's, it's sometimes oppressed and, um, you know, challenged by obviously war, but the opportunity is just, is just, it's just there's so many opportunities out there for 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 you to progress and 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 do something special. That's a great point. And the world is a lot smaller in the year of our Lord 2024, and it, it's amazing how we can connect with people all over from these diverse viewpoints. Hundred percent. That is a wrap. Thank you so much, Bill Clayman, for joining us today to talk your thoughts on ethical AI, your career journey, how music has impacted your career. Just so many different cool topics. Remember, you can help us at Cloud Control Out by leaving a rating or review on your favorite podcast app or sharing and sharing our episodes with your social networks, your friends, family. And you can follow me to continue the discussion, ask questions, and learn more about all my hot takes on all things cloud ops and by following me on social media at Inktator on most of your favorite social media networks. You can also join our official community by jumping into the NetApp Discord server at www.netappdiscord.com. And you can learn more about our product and service offerings and our vision behind intelligent data infrastructure and our AI vision by visiting the NetApp Developer Portal at developer.netapp.com. You can catch us in person and we can catch up on all things CloudOps at KubeCon EU March 19th through the 21st in Paris. And, we, and you can visit spot.io to learn more. 
Thank you again, Bill. Thank you again to all of our listeners for joining us. And until next time, we'll see you in the cloud. Bye, everybody.